Hi Founder fans, Jason here, and today's founder is James Madison. Literally, we are literally going to talk to James Madison. Well, we're going to talk to Kyle Jenks, who is a James Madison interpreter in Philadelphia. Now, if you're headed to Philadelphia or considering heading to Philadelphia, I highly recommend you contact him. I have all of his information down below. You need to meet this man and take his tour. But until then, we're going to have a conversation about James Madison and what it takes to be an interpreter interpreting James Madison. It's a lot of fun. I know you'll enjoy it. So without further ado, here we go. Well, let's start at the beginning. Why James Madison as opposed to any other founder or any other person from history? Oh, you want the easy answer? I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that's but the we're... very, very short answer. Well, what appealed to you about James Madison as opposed to other short people of history? Well, I had to learn what James Madison was all about because what it started with, with was the hobby of reenacting. I don't, I don't live too far from where you're from in uh, near Albany, New York. So I became a reenactor back in 2003, which was midlife for me. And compared to my uh, compatriots, pretty late in life. Most of them grew up as history buffs and I never was. So as the, the hobby evolved and they encourage uh, you to develop a personage, et cetera, whether it's you know, usually a generic one, and you're either a professional or a craftsman or a trader or a merchant or a businessman or something like that. And uh, I just sort of got this whole acting thing that I didn't know turned on a light switch that I felt like I would enjoy doing. And it evolved eventually into a historical figure, but I wanted to stay within the 18th century because in upstate New York, Ticonderoga was the place to be, Crown Point. So I ended up in the French and Indian War era and the American Revolution. So I never anticipated trying to learn another part of history that becomes the early federal period with James Madison's presidency. Um, but every time I tried to pick a, a real historical figure that was short, I'm five foot three. And the average uh, estimate, I guess, that scholars come up with it, he was around five four. So yeah, I can't do George Washington. I can't do Abraham Lincoln. But that's not the way I am anyway, because it was fortuitous, because I always seem to take the harder road or try and find something more unique to do. And I never picked James Madison because there were certain qualities that I liked about him or certain things that I knew about him. He just fit a mold, which was two main factors. Stay in the general time period, because he grew up in the 18th century. He was born in 1751 but he did not pass away until 1836. So that brings him almost up into uh, the development of those pre-Civil War types of actions that we can all look back at, at in retrospect now. So I really just put it off for five years, Jason, five years. I could have been portraying James Madison for five years more because once I found out, I knew who he was, I knew he was the father of the Constitution, um, and I knew he was a brainiac. So because he was a brainiac, I said, I can't do him. That means I got to know the Constitution inside and out. And I don't think I can do that. So out of literal, I was stopped in my tracks from fear <laughs> for five years. But I wanted to do it so bad well, you know, that I just decided, look, he's an important guy. Nobody's doing him to the extent that they are Washington, Franklin, or Lincoln, for example, or Roosevelt, perhaps. And uh, I'm going to give it a shot because somebody said to me, Kyle, just control your performance environment. Basically, don't take questions and answers. Once you do that, you open yourself up to everything and you have to know every aspect of his life, just like you know every aspect of yours. So he came to me more than I went to him. Well, that's a great answer. And it actually reflects a bit on my next question, which was, how much research did you do in preparation? And, and since you did seem to answer that about five years worth, uh, how much research do you put in now to further your expertise? And I guess I'll add on to the end there. Do you now take questions or do you still put off the question? Uh, well, I'll start the one that I can remember, the one, the one they asked me last. Yes, I do take questions now. Okay. But I, I studied him, once I said yes and, and, and pulled the trigger, I studied him for one year 
before I did a public performance that was 25 minutes long on a very specific narrow topic, did not take questions and answers. Uh, the five years was complete, you know, uh, silence. <laughs> there was no action taken whatsoever. I was just scared and I, I didn't even read up on them at all. I just said, I can't do it. There's no way I can do it. So once five years went by and then I talked to the, the, my friend, she said, control the performance environment. And I said, well, I'm not getting any younger. I'm going to go for it. So I do study pretty almost every day. Um, it is always a work in progress because you have to know every single aspect of not only his life, but technically everybody he ever met, right. which is an incredible undertaking. And this is not an acting job um, because there's never cut and there's never the end of the scene. You know, uh, I play him in his 60s usually now, but I try. I also, since I'm in Philadelphia, play him when he's a congressman, about 46 years old. So uh, that's a whole new set of information about his life. And then eventually, if I make it to 85, I'll be playing him at 85 in the year that he dies. Right. Well, good luck with that. That was my next question, is what year or years. So you started with him as an older man and then transitioned to a younger James Madison. Yeah, because uh, I've been doing it for... My first public performance was 2015, so it's five years ago. I'm 62 now. So when he was 62, the War of 1812 was going on. Is it difficult to remember when you're playing Congressman James Madison, oh, wait, no, this thing hasn't happened yet, and that thing hasn't happened yet? Do you ever get tripped up on what lies ahead, so to speak? I think the potential is definitely there to do that. And I found myself rolling my eyes and thinking, wait a minute, and putting all those things in order. But I have a specific event that I've been preparing for. So I'm trying to cover those bases so I don't get tripped up. But yeah, the potential is there. You have to know what has happened and what has not yet happened. Right. Now, uh, as for Madison himself, this is a little bit uh, speculative, but from your estimation, what do you think Madison's most important of his many contributions? What, do you th what stands out to you as one or two of the most important parts of James Madison's time as an American founder? Well, it has to be the Constitution. The Constitution, because that's his big hit. I mean, everything was to build up to writing that thing. From his youth, how he got his classical education, tutored far away at school when he was about 12, 13 years old old. He went 30 miles away to uh, see a Donald Robertson with some other boys. And then when he got to be about a year before he left for New Jersey to go to the College of New Jersey in Princeton, he was tutored at home by Reverend Thomas Martin to prepare him for school. And then when he went to uh, the College of New Jersey, it was run by a Scottish Presbyterian minister named John Witherspoon. And he brought the Enlightenment crucibles over, which were affected James Madison tremendously. He became a patriot. He followed Patrick Henry to Williamsburg for the gunpowder plot there where Dunmore seized the gunpowder. And he, he joined the patriot cause and his calling was to be a statesman. He tried reading law books because he figured he only had one out of two choices, be a lawyer or a minister. And he has a very low speaking voice. You could barely hear the guy. So if there is a performance license that I take, it's I make sure I speak loud enough. Um, another thing for anybody that's watching that happens to know that 18th century men are usually clean shaven, the reason I have a scruff, and it always comes off when I have uh, a Madison performance, but I'm also on a TV show across the river in New Jersey where I'm a scruffy guy. So um, sometimes I have to let it grow out, but it's not for a Madison performance. Um, so the Constitution, I think, he was almost destined to do because his studies and his interest areas were around world governmental systems. It wasn't the minutia of arguing a case for a divorce agreement or a murder in law. And it certainly wasn't being in the pulpit because even though he argued for a religious freedom and he went to his grave with Jefferson uh, being proud of the, the work they did together for Virginia's bill on religious freedom, 
it's the Constitution, in my studied opinion, that he would be most proud of. Well, well said. I certainly can't disagree with it. Uh, before we go, I like to finish every interview by asking, of all the American founders out there, other than James Madison, uh, who do you think doesn't get quite as much appreciation either in American revolutionary circles or in the American population at large? Which founder do you th or founders do you think should be a little bit better known? If I caught you there, Jason, because you were cutting in and out, were you asking me why he isn't more better known? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was asking which founders, other founders, do you think should be a little better known? Robert Morris, uh, Gouverneur Morris, James Wilson. Um, I think some more detailed knowledge should be known about Patrick Henry. He's usually on people's top lists because Patrick Henry and James Madison were opposed to each other eventually uh, when he was very young, just getting into the Virginia House of Delegates and Patrick Henry was the governor, he was all gung-ho because of course Henry was famous for giving the give me liberty or give me death speech in Richmond, Virginia in 1775 to support what was going on in Boston with the closing of the port and the battles at Lexington and Concord. So that's when the Virginians decide to support Boston and get involved in the, in the revolutionary cause. And he was such a powerful auditor, orator and James Madison was not. He spoke very, very calmly. He was, he was very even keeled. He was known for uh, being very you know, stable minded. In other words, thinking things through, not getting aggrandized with his uh, speaking type of thing. And what it turned out, which I think is very important <laughs> to, to, to learn about Patrick Henry was that he never went to the Constitutional Convention. His famous quote was, I smell a rat. He wanted to keep control at the state level because Virginia, arguably, along with your state and my state, upstate New York, were the two most powerful colonies in the country and later states. And he wanted to maintain that. And he didn't see a centralizing of power benefiting Virginians. So besides not going, therefore he didn't sign it. And then he opposed its ratification and Madison had to argue very, very strongly to get Patrick Henry's influence out of people's heads so that Virginia would come on board for ratification. And then one more step after that, not to downplay, I mean, I, I certainly understand uh, Patrick Henry's importance, but as a James Madison interpreter, this is something that comes out uh, when I tell a story, that he had to debate his good friend at the time, even, even then, James Monroe, future fifth president of the United States and his secretary of war and secretary of state when he was president to get a seat in the House of Representatives. Because before gerrymandering ever happened, Patrick Henry did that first. So you can say there was a case of Henry mandering when uh, Henry having the power as the governor in Virginia to change the voting district lines to favor James Monroe over James Madison. And James Madison still won out, but he didn't get to the Senate like everybody anticipated. He settled, quote, quote unquote, for the House, but he was more well suited to the House, in my opinion, because he was the great mediator. He was sort of the internal diplomat in uh, the House of Representatives, the House of the People. So uh, that's where he could take the opposition factions and bring them to compromise in the middle. He was very, very good at that. Became one of the criticisms for his presidency when they said that he didn't you know, take an overt stance. You know, he always mulled things over and he took too much time, which was one of the criticisms about the War of 1812 because his Secretary of uh, Treasury at the time, Albert Gallatin said something on the order of that I never knew Mr. Madison to uh, you know, make a rash decision. But when he did make a decision, he stayed the course. And that's what he did with the War of 1812. So, um, yeah, so the other ones that I've listed, of course, I, I just w went on and on about Patrick Henry, but James Wilson, he was a Superior Court judge, worked a lot in the Constitutional Convention, uh, kind of sided with Madison, spoke many, many, many times. Madison was like the second most uh, frequent speaker. Wilson was way up there. 
uh, Gouverneur Morris, he wrote the preamble to the Constitution. Uh, Robert Morris, financier of the American Revolution, Philadelphian, very, very influential guy, uh, ended up going bankrupt. It was kind of a sad story. Um, so yeah, and then a couple others that I think I missed, but um, they're kind of Philadelphians because every time, ever since I've been to Philadelphia, I'm also a tour guide. So I've also found it difficult to comprehend that Madison is so invisible in the very birthplace of our nation. And I'm trying to figure out why still. And it's almost a single-handed effort, in my opinion, to bring his name recognition where it should be, in my opinion. So I, I'm very passionate. Now that I've figured him out and pretty much fallen in love with the guy, I think he is one of our, our most virtuous founding fathers. He was a gracious man. He never said a bad word about anybody, except sometimes John Adams. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he was very even keeled. He, he, he was a great conversationalist. He gets a bad rap for being a brainiac and boring and unsociable. But when he's in private company, he is just jovial and happy and loves conversation and loves kids. The kids loved him. Truly a great man. I, I have to say that Henry Mandering is one of the greatest slogans I've heard in a very, very long <laughs> time. Uh, before I let you go, for people out there who are interested in either reenacting or interpreting, do you have any recommendations on, on where they might start, maybe an organization they might contact to help them get information or anything of that nature? The best place well, to start research? Reenacting is much easier. Um, if you decide to become an interpreter of a historical figure, I don't know of any organizations that you can fall back on. Uh, you pretty much have to go it on your own and be ready for a lot of uh, delayed gratification, unless you want to portray a very popular figure, but then you're going to have some more competition too. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Kyle. We really appreciate you coming, taking the time to inform us on so many different things, but especially James Madison. Uh, and I look forward to having you back soon. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I certainly did. As I said, if you find yourself in Philadelphia, you need to go meet James Madison. I have all the information down below. Go check it out. Check him out on Instagram. Thank you so much again for Mr. Jenks for hanging out with us and giving this great interview. I will see you with another founder tomorrow.